guys are deep into the, the labs and the hearings getting prepared for those. So by now, you should all have become pretty familiar with what is the economic way of thinking, at least as defined in terms of the text. Anyone want to volunteer what is the economic way of thinking? Anyone at all? Yes? Isn't it the way of like basically viewing the, like, how like, society and the world works based on every individual acting in their own interest to create like, kind of like an organized system? Uh, that's, that's broadly sure. Uh, there's this definition in the textbook. Anybody know the textbook definition? The economic way of thinking is understanding that uh, the world around us is created by choice. It's the study of choice and the unintended consequences. Okay? You say unintended consequences. Well, unintended consequences we'll get to later, but what is choice? You'll be surprised to know what choice is and how far we can get in our understanding of reality with just understanding the word choice. So choice is implies the existence of options, right? So if you have a choice to do something, that means you can either do that thing or something else. It could be the opposite. You could have multiple choices, right? Choice also implies some degree of freedom. If you didn't have freedom, you didn't have a choice, right? When you sit on the doctor's table, and I don't think doctors do this anymore, but they used to hit your knee with a little hammer, and then your leg would kick out. Did you have a choice for your leg kicking out when the doctor hits you with the hammer? No. Did you have a choice to sit down on the table when the doctor asked you to? Yes. So, there are some things that you can choose, some things that you can't choose. Economics is the study of choice. Choice implies options. Choice also implies freedom. Choice also implies purpose. What are you choosing for? Right? In economics, we say you're choosing towards some sort of end, objective, or goal. You're choosing for some goal. If you're choosing for a goal, to satisfy a goal, attain a goal, attain an end, then what you're choosing is between means. Make sense? You're choosing between means to satisfy a given end. Where do our ends come from? That's psychology. That is not economics. What end is good? What end is bad? What you should be aiming for? What you shouldn't be aiming for? That's not economics. Economics takes ends as given. You say, you, these are your ends, you tell me what your ends are, and then now I'm going to analyze your choices that way. Here's another fun thing. We can, so the existence of choice should have been enough to prove to you that you have some freedom. That's pretty major. The existence of choice also implies the existence of time. Why? Because you're choosing towards some end, and you're choosing between some means. Is the end in the present, or the past, or somewhere else? Where is the end in terms of time? It's in the future. The end is in the future and your choice is in the present. You choose in the present to satisfy some future end. That's time, the present and the future. You can also use the past to inform 
what ends might be good or what means might be best. So the concept of choice, just thinking about the word choice, we infer that the existence of freedom and the existence of time. Isn't that interesting? Any questions so far? Questions? I just proved to you time exists. There are people out there, physicists and others, who say time doesn't exist or time is a cue, some absurd thing. Time is a... <laughs> humans perceive time in a linear fashion. So we got choices, we've got time. Choice also, when you choose one thing over another, we call that an exchange, right? Can you exchange with yourself? Yes or no? Who says yes? What can you exchange with yourself? Um, you can exchange one task for another, so you can spend more time on something instead of didn't like sacrifice another choice. Yeah. You can choose to study, or you can choose to game. We call that intrapersonal exchange. An older term for this, you might read, uh, is autistic exchange. We don't use that word anymore. Intrapersonal exchange. Intra, within yourself. Of course, that doesn't take you very far because man is a social animal. We evolved as a society, we evolved as a species through society. It's very rare, and in fact, it's a type of torture to isolate people. So it's not very interesting to study uh, individual choice, intrapersonal choice. So what economic studies is interpersonal choice. The choice, the exchange is made between different people. Okay? Say there are two people, call them Pat and Alex. Pat has a pear, Alex has an apple. The fact that they each have these apples, they each, each have these fruits, that means that they, they must have valued them for some reason. That's how they got them, right? Now, we're talking about interpersonal exchange. If Alex values the pear more than the apple, and if Pat values the apple more than the pear, can anything happen? Say, I'm Alex, this is Pat. I have an apple, but I want a pear. Pat has a pear, but Pat wants an apple. Can anything, can we do anything about this situation, Pat and I? Yes? What can we do for those nodding? Tell me. We can exchange. We can exchange my uh, apple for his pear, or Vice versa. By exchanging, by taking part of it in this exchange, am I better off, worse off, or just as well off as I was before? Yes. Better off? Anyone disagree? I am better off. What about my exchange partner? They're also better off. Interpersonal exchange, at least, we say ex ante, that's uh, Latin for before the fact. Interpersonal exchange, always people in, expected to make them better off. You only take part in exchange, well I say, I said interpersonal, but it could be intrapersonal too. You only take part in an exchange, whether interpersonal or intrapersonal, if you expect to be better off. This is a very, very new insight in the history of human society, in the history of science. Up until about 200 years ago, most people, up, up through at least the time of Aristotle, almost certainly before, most philosophers and scientists thought that exchange, there had to be an equivalency of value. Why is 
that wrong? If exchange was about equivalent values, why would that be wrong? Yes? Why would you ever exchange something for equivalent thing? Exactly. Why would you ever exchange some, th something for something equal? You only exchange if you expect to benefit. And let's not forget that value is subjective. Value is subjective, means it's within yourself. We don't all share the same values. We don't all share the same ends. Yes? Did you have to say then that you only willingly exchange if you expect to get something better out of it? Yes. Okay. So <coughs> choice, the freedom, that has to be part of your will, right? Some people sleepwalk, right? Sleepwalk, they sleepwalk, and then they do all sorts of weird things when they sleepwalk. They go and they make food or they get something out of the fridge. Uh, there's something called, uh, there are those who sleepwalk and have sex with others, right? But they're not aware of it. They're asleep, they're unconscious. It's an issue. Legally, ethically, morally, what do we do about those situations? I can tell you that economically, we can't analyze it. Because the person engaging in that kind of behavior isn't aware of their own choices. That's beyond economics. That's ethics, you know, uh, uh, psychology, law, not economics. Economics, you have to be making the choice consciously. What if somebody chooses to sit and meditate for the rest of their life? Is that economical? Are monks doing economics? Can we analyze monks using economics? I see nodding. Yes. Yes, you can. Yeah. They're choosing to forego all their earthly possessions and choosing to enter into a state of uh, unconscious bliss or whatever, what have you. Up until the point where they attain it nirvana, we can analyze their decisions using economics. Once they've attained nirvana, then maybe talk to a theologist, theologian. Whenever somebody's making a conscious choice, you can use the tools of economics. So let's go back to our interpersonal exchange example. So we started with the assumption that Pat had a pear and Alex had an apple. Where did the pear and the apple come from? So you could say that, oh, they just found them on a random tree somewhere. But then how did they get them off the tree? Did they climb up the tree, pick them up? Or did they maybe find a large stick somewhere and then use that stick as a tool to whack the tree and get the pears and throw the fruits down. Right? That using a tool, that's still part of economics. Which tool to use and what is the, the most optimal shape of the stick and the weight and the striking method? We can talk about engineering that way. But economics is not the same thing as engineering. Engineering, you have your goal, just like economics, you have your goal. But then you also have no choice. There's an objective answer, because you have you've given everything, you all the information you've given to the engineering problem, and then you solve it somehow. So you have your stick, how much should it weigh? How long should it be, etc.? That's an engineering problem. All we know from an economics uh, standpoint is that a person using a stick to get an apple from a tree values the stick as a means and the apple as his end. You can say that. You can get much more complicated too. So we have. So, go 
going back to the situation. So let's say I had, I was Pat, and I, as Pat, have a pear orchard, you know, a garden where I make where I have a bunch of pear trees. That's all I have. Before I met Alex with his apple trees, I was only growing pears for myself. Pears were the only thing I ate. Alex was doing the same thing with his apples. If I was only growing apples for, or sorry, pears for myself, am I going to be growing more pears than I could ever eat? Probably not. That'd be too much effort. I'd only be probably making as many pears as I could handle in a season. Maybe a, a little extra for the winter. But now that I've discovered Alex, and we have invented interpersonal exchange. Now I get the idea that maybe if I grow more pears, I can exchange these pears for apples. In a sense, exchange is, is, is an invention, is a machine that, transfer, that transforms pears into apples. Right? I grow apples, and then I go into a magic box, and I come out with uh, pears or whatever. What happened was exchange. His app, Alex's apples, my pears, we exchanged. He gets, he grows more apples. I grow more pears, but in the end, we each have more apples and pears than we would have had in isolation. Over time, other people figure out this idea. And other people start growing different things. And when we, were, when we were in isolation, the pears and the apples we were each creating, we said, we would say that uh, the only value that they have is value and use. I can only grow the pears because I can use the, the pears uh, to eat. That's the only use I get for nourishment. But now that I've discovered exchange, I can use the pairs in addition for use, but in exchange. So they now, we say, have exchange value. There is use value and exchange value. Pairs now, and apples now, have both a use value and an exchange value. So we have physical reality. This is the reality of pears and apples. Right? And then we have consumers. I'm an apple or I make pears, but I'm an apple consumer. Alex is, uh, uh, Alex makes apples, but he's a pear consumer. For me, as someone who doesn't make apples, I have to go find an apple producer, right? <coughs> In terms of time, which comes first, consumers, producers, or physical reality when it comes to economics? Which is first? So when I say consumers, I mean consumer preferences, right? I, I'm a consumer, I have a preference for apples. Alex has a preference for pears. Which comes first? Yes. Um, wouldn't the consumer have to come first because they have to be like a demand or like someone to value the product before they're someone who's gonna like see that we're gonna produce it? You are smarter than every man, woman, and child who thought about economics prior to 1871. Congratulations. That, that's Aristotle, that's Plato, that's uh, uh, St. Thomas. Consumers are first. The, the direction of causality is this way, from consumers backwards. 
you know there's consumer demand. Alex knew there was consumer demand for his apples. So then he produced more apples. He changed the physical reality to produce more apples to then meet the, the consumer demand. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Yes? Will it not be a cycle if the product goes back to the consumers and then it goes back to them? Would it be a cycle? If, so, so we get this way, so now we're wondering if it's going, going to go the other way. So we have now all these extra apples. Does the producer then create more apples? Or he has more apples to do something with. Can he create more consumers? Well, in a sense, yes, through what we can call advertising, right? But advertising affects psychology. When Alex creates demand, creates uh, uh, the preference in other people. He is uh, trying to convince other people to value apples more than they currently do. That's psychology. That is not economics. Because he can fail in his endeavors to convincing other people. Coca-Cola, you all see now on the bottles and cans everywhere, it says Coca-Cola Classic. Why does it say Coca-Cola Classic? Who knows why? What? Yes? Uh, because at some point in China, they changed the formula and the, and it wasn't as successful, so then they reverted to the old formula and yeah. that better than our people? Yeah. Well, so there was a time when they changed the formula for Coca-Cola, and they called it New Coke. Called a new coke, they spent an untold godly amount of money. They got all the celebrities at the time, this was the 1980s, uh, all the top celebrities to endorse new coke. And the consumers hated it. So they tried that for a while, and then once they gave up on trying to change consumer preferences, they reverted back to the, uh, the original Coca Cola recipe, which they called Coca Cola Classic. This was at a time when Pepsi was beating Coke in the, in the Cola Wars, as they're called. And uh, they, Coke tried to spice things up with new Coke, and it failed. And they went back to Coke Classic. And uh, people say it was a mark, the whole thing was a marketing ploy because uh, the sales of Coke rose higher than they were before new Coke. But that's psychology. The point of that story was they spent a lot of money and effort to make New Coke a thing, and they couldn't make New Coke a thing. So they brought back the original Coke. So just because you spend a lot of money, you're a gigantic corporation. Coca-Cola is the world's most understood word. You go to anywhere in the world and you say Coca-Cola, they'll understand what you mean. The second most common word is okay. So not even the owners of the most well-known word in history can change preferences at will. Yes? I was going to say, what are the new products that no one knows about? Like, before there were phones, yeah. and then there were no consumers who does any more culture. So when did it change? So before, before there were phones, well, well, what came first? So the inventor of the phone was he sitting alone in a cave and then just decided one day to invent a phone? Who invented the phone? Who invented the phone? Graham Bell, right? Alexander Graham Bell. Here's a fun fact about Alexander Graham Bell's invention of the phone. We call him the inventor of the phone because he was the first person to file a patent for the phone. But there were other people working on the same technology at the same time, and they were a few minutes to a few days late to filing the patent. So there was something in the air at that time for so many different people to want to all invent the phone. And the reason was 
the phone was just a superior version of the telegraph and other uh, methods of uh, communication. So there's a kind of entrepreneurship that goes on when you're inventing something. And entrepreneurship, we'll get to this later in the semester, but fundamentally, entrepreneurship is about predicting the future. It's about fortune telling. Entrepreneurs, good entrepreneurs, can predict the future better than the rest of us. They can predict what the demand will be for products that don't even exist yet. And in a sense, it doesn't matter whether it's a phone that they've invented or whether it's just a new brand of cat litter. They're changing the entire structure of the economy with every new thing that they produce. Sometimes they have to educate more people, sometimes less. But they still have to educate, they still have to advertise, they still have to inform the market that they exist and that their product can serve the ends of the consumers. Speaking about the ends of the consumers, say you have your ends. Say you want to eat and you want to sleep. Can we say that, <laughs> that you want to eat? Okay, right now, you want to, do you want to eat or sleep right now? Sleep. Uh, if I offer you something to eat, uh, would you eat it? Yes. Yes? Do you have any food in your backpack right now? No. no? Have you had lunch already? No. So you're going to have lunch later? Yes. Do you know what you're going to have for lunch? No? Well, what would you typically have for lunch? A sandwich. A sandwich. So you would have the option of your sandwich versus sleep. Are you more likely to have your sandwich after this class or sleep? Then eat, eat, eat first, then sleep. So can we say that you prefer eating one sandwich times more than sleeping? No. That was a little confusing as an example. So you have some, uh, so you all have friends and then you have a best friend, or maybe a couple of best friends. Would it, say you have your best friend and then you have your second best friend. Would it make sense to say that you value your best friend twice as much as your second best friend? No. When we say, when we multiply things, or express things in terms of multiples, there's some sort of unit that we are sharing between them, right? So if I have 10 pears and Alex has uh, five banana or five apples, we can say I have twice as many fruit than Alex, but I can't say I have 10 times as many bananas than he does. That's 10 times zero, he has zero bananas, right? So this is the case with ends. So you have your ends, When you choose one end over another, when you choose, so say Alex, we have Alex and we have Pat. Alex has an apple, Pat has a pear. But we already said that Pat prefers an apple to a pear, and Alex prefers a pear to, a banana, to an apple. So, when they make this exchange, it's because Alex prefers a pair that he doesn't have. This is Alex's first best ranking, and his second best end, right? These so are rankings of his ends. In parentheses, means he doesn't have it. For Pat, Pat's first ranked end is an apple that Pat doesn't have, and second is a pair that Pat does have. So they do this exchange. Pat gives the pear to Alex, and Alex gives the apple to Pat. 
and they're both better off. Ranks or ends like this are ordered. So the word, this is a technical word you'll never use outside of this class in your life. But this is ordinal preferences. That means things are ordered. Right? This is ordinal compared to something called cardinal. That means you can add things and multiply them. Right? The numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they're cardinal numbers because I can add 1, 2, 2 to get 3. But first, second, third, fourth are ordinal. Okay? Preferences are ordinal. If you ever take another economics class, they'll talk about uh, utility, right? And they'll even assign utils to your utility. So they'll say, oh, this apple will bring 100 utils. And this pair has 50 utils for Pat. Some amateurs will then say that uh, to Pat, a pair has twice as many utils than, or sorry, an apple has twice as many utils as a pair. This is wrong, because even in, in those other classes where they use this uh, mathematical mumbo jumbo, these utils are still ranked ordinally. Okay? So, back to our example. Alex and Pat are now getting pretty used to exchanging pears and apples with each other. <coughs> And they've convinced everyone else in the community to also exchange pears and apples. With the rest of the community, some one of these fruits becomes uh, people prefer it more than others. Let's say it's apples. In fact, they start buying apples in order to exchange them for other things. Call this indirect exchange. So I have. Uh, so let's say this gentleman here has a laptop and he wants, uh, he wants a TV. In order to find a TV before, uh, without apples, etc., he'll have to find someone with a TV who also wants a laptop. And then he'll have to find someone with the TV that he wants who wants his laptop. We call this the problem of a double coincidence of wants. And what we have with over time is uh, when we start exchanging things slowly first and then quickly, we realize that some things are wanted the most by everyone in the community. And the thing that's wanted and exchanged with the most, that's what we call money. Money is the most common say, medium of exchange. It's the most common medium of exchange. It could be whatever. And it always, money always evolves through this buying and selling process, through something that has exchange value, and then it evolves that way, and then it becomes, goes through the process and ranks. Yes? So does indirect exchange always go can they be exclusive? No, indirect exchange always goes with double coincidence of wants. You can, well, unless you use violence and pillaging and stuff. Yes? If we're saying that everyone values money, if it's like the thing everyone values the most, why would you trade money for something else? If it's like the thing that's valued most. It's valued in exchange. It's the most common medium of exchange. So you value it because you can exchange it. Here's an example of the evolution of money. Prisons, uh, right now, if you go to a prison in the US, they don't, you're not allowed to have money in the prison, except to buy things from what's called the commissary, the prison store. So what happened 
naturally over all the prisons in the, in the federal, uh, federal, pris federal prisons in the US is that something called, or packets of fillets of mackerel fish became money over time. People started trading, they trade things in prison. And people found out that fillets of mackerel uh, had a high exchange value, so they called them max. Instead of bucks, they called them max. And they would start trading things for max. People start betting things with max. Here's another interesting thing. You can still eat the max, but you can also exchange them. Max have a three year shelf life. People are in prison sometimes longer than three years. Five years, 10 years, 15 years. You can still stock up on your max. But when a Mac expires, you can't eat it anymore. So the value drip, uh, drops a little bit. It drops about to 75% of its original amount value. But you still use this Mac for exchange. This Mac is now called a money Mac instead of an eating Mac. Money Macs are worth a little less than eating Macs, but they're still exchanged in the prison society. So useful is the concept of money that even in prisons, they're forced to invent a new money. Max, yes? So that with the person, like the richest person, the person with the most max or money, or the person with the most names? Excellent question. What does it mean to be rich, to be wealthy? To be rich and wealthy means to satisfy your own ends. Typically, in a big society like ours, you need money to satisfy your ends. So we, as a shorthand, say the person with the most money is the richest. But you have to remember, richness, wealth, happiness, these are all personal things. A monk with nothing can be happier than Bill Gates. It's all within you. Some people say uh, they, they, they deny this origin of money story. And they'll say, oh, actually money was, uh, we didn't have, it didn't go through this process, this evolution. We had, uh, we had credit first. We had credit, and then credit became money. Well, if, if you and I are different tribes, and as different tribes, uh, you give me one thing, and then I say, okay, you got some credit with me, and I'll give you something later. What's the difference between this and our exchange with uh, Pat and Alex? The only difference is the length of time. A credit exchange is a barter exchange over a longer period of time. It's not a fundamentally different exchange. But a money exchange is different. Because money exchange is indirect. So, I think that's, uh, that's going to be it for this week. So thank you guys.